Hi, welcome uh, to my garden and uh, thanks for joining us for this Long Point Basin Land Trust workshop about monarchs and monarch tagging. My name is Catherine Boothby. I consider myself an enthusiast of butterflies and uh, I'm sure a few of you know me from previous workshops out at the George and Shirley Pond Nature Reserve, a beautiful spot on the shores of Lake Erie. So today I'm going to talk about the monarch in general, about creating way stations and the importance of doing so, and a little bit about the life cycle. So here we go, hopefully uh, we can get through this with you all still being tied right into uh, what we're talking about. So um, many people don't know that the uh, monarch is globally listed as an endangered species. Uh, in Canada and Ontario, it's a species of special concern under the federal and provincial species at risk act. Um, and of course, with this level of concern about the species and as hosts to this beautiful butterfly during its breeding months, uh, it's really important that we create as much habitat as possible to help increase the numbers and strengths of these butterflies while they're here so that there is a good strong contingent that uh, migrates south to Mexico at this time of year. So that's what we're going to talk a little bit about. So creating more habitat. Um, loss of habitat in both North America and in Mexico where they spend their winters is one of the major threats uh, to the species. As for many other species, whether it's birds or insects or others. Um, so what we're going to do is talk about a little bit about the how-tos of establishing one our way station. Okay, so before we start talking about the how-tos of establishing a monarch way station, we really know about, need to know about their life cycle and how they spend their time in Canada before we can create just the right habitat that keeps them coming back year after year. So here is a very brief synopsis of their life cycle, which I'll go into in more detail. So egg, larva, pupa, and adult. So the female can lay uh, between 300 and 400 eggs in just a few weeks. I'm glad that's not my job. Uh, they usually lay one per milkweed plant, gluing it to the underside of a leaf. Now you'll say, well, I've seen lots of eggs on one milkweed plant. Well, guess what? There are lots of monarchs laying their one egg on all of the different milkweeds. So you, you could see three, four, five, or four milkweeds. And uh, if there's only very few milkweeds in your area, you may see even more. Don't be surprised to see the same ones, you know, more than one on the same plant. Um, monarch eggs are about one millimeter long. They're very small and they are kind of a creamy yellow in color and they're ridged. If you could think of an American football, I'm English so I have to say an American football, so if you think of an American football and how they have those ridges down the side and where the, where the, um, the laces are. So that would kind of be the shape and how the ridges look, but it's very cream. Um, and then it's usually on the underside of the leaf, as shown here. So after about three to five days, those eggs will hatch. Um, and out will come a caterpillar, which is teeny, teeny tiny and very difficult to see. Usually the way I know that the eggs have hatched is because on the underside of the leaf, you'll just see some little nibblings, little tiny nibblings on the underside of the leaf. It's like, oh, he's here somewhere. And you can see that little bit of latex seeping out of the of the milkweed leaf. So the caterpillar has uh, three sections on its body, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Um, and then it has a little tiny antenna on its head. Uh, it does have 12 simple eyes, um, and that helps it kind of tell the variations in daylight, but it really doesn't see very well. Um, so you can get pretty close to it without it rearing up and grabbing you. <laughs> Um, like all uh, insects, uh, monarchs have three sets of legs, uh, that's how you know they're an insect, and that's attached to the thorax. Um, and then if you look a little closer, you might say, well, hang on a second, there's another pair of little legs here, closer to the head, but they're, they're fake legs. Um, they actually are little suction cups that helps it hang on to the monarch, uh, the milkweed leaf. Um, I often think when I see those torrential rains coming down, how are those little caterpillars hanging on there? But they have got some pretty sturdy little suction cups 
uh, there. So it helps it to cling to the leaf during those bad weather events and also while it's feeding. So, uh, caterpillars spend most of their time eating, um, but the very first meal immediately after it comes out of the egg is actually that egg because it's full of lots of protein, so it's very, uh, very healthy for it. So it eats the egg case, which has all the nutrients it needs to start, and then it starts on the milkweed, and it's very um, organized in just munching around the leaf, munching, 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 and getting bigger and bigger, uh, and... Um, they feed exclusively on milkweeds. Uh, there are quite a few varieties of milkweed. There is um, the butterfly milkweed that we see in the prairies, in, on the, um, on the uh, prairie grass fields. This is a little limp right now because I picked it earlier. But this is called the butterfly milkweed. Very thin leaves. Um, Asclepias tuberosa, if you're interested in the fancy name for it. Um, so there's that one there. There's also the common milkweed, which I have here. As you'll see, there's a little caterpillar there having a little nap after chewing away on these for a little while. Um, there's also, uh, and this, this is the one, this is the common milkweed, which you see along the roadsides with the big pink flowers, very um, floral scent, uh, just beautiful in the, uh, in the late summer and, um, and uh, with the big milk pods, milk weed seed pods like this on them. The seed pods for the butterfly milkweed are much narrower, you see the difference in those. So this is the two you have here, the common milkweed, the butterfly milkweed, there's also swamp milkweed that you found in, find in wetter areas, poke milkweed, there is whorled milkweed, the short green milkweed, there are many varieties of milkweeds. And the monarch caterpillar will only eat the milkweed plant, which makes it a specialist. Um, and they're one of the very few species that are actually able to tolerate the poisonous sap that's in the milkweed. As I'm sure you've seen, as soon as you break a piece, it'll start to uh, seeping. Of course, this one's not going to do it for me. There we are. Seeping uh, white sap which uh, looks very milky, uh, hence it gets its name, I, I suppose. Um, and as I say, it's toxic to many other creatures. Um, the monarch caterpillar is able to um, convert that into nutrients for itself and also to help protect itself from predators because um, it has a, what's called cardinolids or cardinolides. I have no idea how to say that. I'll guess. You can figure it out. Um, and that makes them poisonous in turn to things like birds and, um, and insects, like rob robber flies, etc. So as the monarch caterpillar grows, because it's just on this all-you-can-eat buffet of milkweed for, um, for uh, 9 to 15 days, it just grows bigger and bigger and bigger. Its weight increases 2,700 times in that short time. Now, if we if, as humans grew that quickly, um, we'd be as tall as the, as the Statue of Liberty in that time, uh, in just two weeks. So to keep up with this growth, the caterpillar obviously has to shed its skin because it's very rapid growth. So it's kind of like a snake in that way. It gets to a certain size and then it'll shuffle out of its skin and pop it off and pop it'll go on a, another eating frenzy and just keep going. It usually goes um, through five molts, or what are called instars. Uh, now, only 10% of these little caterpillars actually reach the pupal stage. Although their toxic defenses are effective against uh, some birds and mammals, many of them still fall victim to predators and parasites. I mean, even if uh, one were to be caught and pinched and then dropped afterwards, you've still damaged the caterpillar, so it... Uh, can no longer continue. So, pupa, here, I actually have a live one. I'm going to bend down now. <laughs> they will show up all over the garden. This was a piece of wood that was used to prop up the sun guard on my hubby's van. And the monarch decided this would be the perfect place to just hide in its, uh, in its 
little chrysalis there in its pupal state. So look at the lovely glistening, hopefully you can see the glistening crown it has here and a few little flecks in the body of the chrysalid. And that um, helps to reflect the sun so it can be a little bit more well disguised. So I've got a few of these around my garden, they're, as I say, near the car, so have to take a look around the car. Sometimes they'll go on the, the, um, the wheel arch of the car. I also have them hanging off the steps of the deck as well, so it's quite lovely to see. So I'll put that back down here. Return it to its spot later, it'll probably be another five days before it, uh, before it uh, encloses. So, uh, after the monarch has finished feeding, it's into its final instar, then it'll crawl away somewhere quiet, like I've just shown you, the steps of the deck or an evergreen tree or just somewhere quiet and it'll hang in a J shape. And it'll hang in that J shape for 12 to 48 hours, just contemplating life, I think. <laughs> Uh, and exactly how it's going to make this grand metamorphosis from caterpillar to chrysalid. So, uh, it uses a silken anchor to anchor itself to the J, and then it creates its chrysalis. The turquoise green colouring, as I mentioned, kind of reflects the light, and uh, it gradually changes from jade green to bluish, and then as the chrysalis uh, and the butterfly inside um, transforms, the casing of the chrysalid starts to become more transparent and just before it's about to come out you can actually often see the, um, the wings of the caterpillar through the transparent chrysalid. It's quite a marvelous thing to see. So after 8 to 15 days that is when the adult monarch will emerge. Now it's very important when an adult monarch emerges that you don't just go grab it go, oh monarch, because it is quite wet when it first comes out of the chrysalid. It's, it looks, doesn't look a, anything like a, a butterfly at all. It usually has quite a long fat body and stubby little wings and what happens is the butterfly will find somewhere calm and cool to just hang and then it starts to pump waste from its body and it starts to pump uh, what is called um, hemolymph or it's basically the butterfly's blood into its wings and you'll see it just start to pump itself up and those wings will start to, to come out and the colour will begin to come and then once they're fully open they will just rest in the sun to dry and it takes a few hours for that to happen and you don't want to be touching it too quickly because those scales can come off on your fingers and that can uh, you know, damage the, uh, the butterfly itself. So just let it be calm for a while and get through all of that, over all of that uh, amazing metamorphosis that has been through and just enjoy those few minutes of relaxation as it comes into its own, as we say. So within about four to five hours, that's when those wings will have unfolded and stiffened and the butterfly can take flight. And all of a sudden you'll just see it just disappear off its perch and go in search of, guess what, food. It's hungry. It's had nothing to eat for 16 days after uh, eating um, constantly for three weeks. So it needs more food. So this is where the monarch butterfly goes from being a specialist as a caterpillar to being a generalist as an adult. They like nectar, they are nectar feeders, and they don't need only milkweed uh, to nectar on. The milkweed is for laying eggs and to host the caterpillars. So things that I make available in my gardens, for example, are lots of native plants. So right now, native grasses, goldenrod, three different varieties of goldenrod here. Purple top verbena, verbena banariensis, Mexican sunflower, also known as Tithonia, sedum, many varieties, zinnia, 
pom-pom and standard. Butterfly bush. And seven thumbs tree. Brown-eyed Susans. This is butterfly milkweed. Lovely orange flowers, narrow leaf, and a narrow seed pod. And then this is common milkweed with one of our little friends. There. And that has the big fat pods that you're used to seeing along the roadside and the beautiful pink flower heads. Fall aster. This is, uh, I have the New England aster in the front of the garden. This one is a hybrid, which is called Professor Kippensdorf, but uh, he is uh, very happy to accept the flowers as well. We have a sea of zinnias here, which are usually a lot taller when we have a, a, a more rain, but being on a well here, we don't water our gardens. We prefer to water ourselves. So they don't grow as tall in a drought year. Um, the butterfly bush, which come in many sizes, from seven feet tall to just you know, two foot high. And uh, the orange at the back, that's the Mexican sunflower we spoke of earlier. The red that you see is actually amaranth, and that is one of the host plants for the common sooty wing butterfly. Now we've talked about the life cycle, we can talk a little bit about uh, the way stations. We've talked about some of the nectar plants, etc. So, hello. <laughs> So why do we need way stations? Well, just like any long journey that you and I take, uh, monarchs need a place to rest and refuel. Uh, they are traveling over 3,000 kilometers to get to their destination. Now, I don't know about you, but I would have a hard time traveling 3,000 kilometers without a food break and a bathroom break. <laughs> so just like, uh, just like us, they, they need places to stop over to, to refuel so that they can get going. Um, but unfortunately, much of the vast prairie and grasslands that were once home for monarchs and other migratory species, including birds, have been replaced by farms, cities, and urban sprawl. This leaves some huge gaps um, in that migratory route that the monarchs take, uh, where they're unable to find food and shelter. And this really has quite an impact on the success of the migration both to Mexico and returning from Mexico. So monarch way stations that we all help to create can help to fill some of those gaps and give monarchs a helping hand on this mammoth journey that they take every year. So we know that the monarch about the monarch life cycle and their needs so let's talk a little bit about creating that waste station in your backyard so that we can keep them around for our children and our children's children and so on so the first consideration is to keep it simple uh, so there are two considerations when it comes to location first is sunlight butterflies and typically the plants that they feed on need full sunlight for at least six hours a day. Butterflies are most active at 30 degrees. That will, that's when you see them zipping around like crazy things. Um, 30 degrees is their prime temperature. Second is drainage. Most butterfly plants like dry, well-drained sites, except of course for swamp milkweed, as the name suggests. Um, so, Find a sloped or dry location for your way station. I'm out here on the Norfolk sand plain, so yeah, it's pretty dry out here. The, the, um, the soil drains very quickly, so we don't have too much problem. It's, uh, and then I have to dig big holes to find the wet stuff. <laughs> um, so those are the things to think about. And then of course, there are three habitat considerations. Milkweed for the larva, nectar for the adults, and shelter. Um, a vegetative shelter for both the butterflies and caterpillars uh, from predators and from the weather. So we've talked about some of all the plants uh, that I have here and that you can grow in your garden and of course there are many many more. Um, I could go on for hours about <laughs> plants that uh, 
that butterflies like. Um, purple coneflower is another one that I didn't mention. Uh, and liatris, uh, they have pretty much finished by now, but during the summertime, they are great nectar plants for the adults, the parent monarchs that are staying here. Uh, so once, you, uh, and we talked about zinni, etc. So even if you have the tiniest square, no bigger than this table in um, in a city, you can create a monarch way station because there is enough space here to grow a zinnia and a couple of, of um, native grasses, uh, you know, a, a specialized goldenrod, some zinnias, etc. There is plenty of space to just create that little haven that when a monarch is flying over um, a concrete wasteland they'll just see that oasis and come down and uh, get the, the um, fuel they need to continue. Uh, so once you've got your monarch station, way station up and blooming, you can get it certified. Yes, you can get your monarch way station certified. We are a certified monarch way station here. Um, it's pretty simple to do and it's a great way to validate the hard work you've already done. And your way station will add to those that have already been certified and help to create that migration corridor that goes from you know, Quebec all the way down to Mexico um, uh, to help the struggling population who can need, who really do need all the help that they can get. So in Southern Ontario, the last time I checked, there were only um, just over 550 way stations across an area that covers 130,000 square kilometers. So that basically equates to one way station per 245 square miles, uh, square kilometers, sorry. So imagine traveling that distance to lay eggs or to grab a meal. That's a long way. You use, basically used up all your energy just getting there and then, you know, Hopefully it is enough to keep you sustained. So most of the way stations that are around Toronto, for example, are along the north shore of Lake Ontario. There are very few along the north shore of Lake Erie, which is the area that I'm in right now, and in a triangle between Aylmer, Tilsonburg and Turkey Point. Uh, there are only five last time I checked in that area. So let's get going, folks. <laughs> Um, and for those who live in Toronto, it's not just on the north shore of Lake Erie, uh, Lake Ontario, that the way stations are needed because the monarchs are traveling quite a distance from more northerly locations passing through Toronto to Lake Ontario before they cross the lake. So don't think of way stations as only needed on, in the migration period at the lake. They're required all summer long from north through to the south and beyond our borders. So, and this is the last point when you think about it, the North Shore of Lake Ontario and the North Shore of Lake Erie, it's, it's the last point for the monarchs to fuel before a major water crossing because they fly often across the lake. Some go round, but still it's a long way round and some fly right across the lake. So we can do better. So let's add your name to the list of monarch way, way stations. After all, there are hundreds and hundreds of monarchs that pass through our area every spring and fall during migration. They need to fuel up in the fall before heading out across Lake Erie. And then the new generation in the spring is looking to replenish what has been lost flying across the lake to reach their breeding grounds in Canada in the spring. So let's help them on that journey. Find out a lot more about uh, monarch way stations at monarchwatch.org and I'll be talking about them a little bit more as we move into the section about just how do you tag a monarch butterfly. Okay, so before we get started on monarch tagging, we need to know a couple of things. Number one, what is a monarch and what is not a monarch? Because it can be a little confusing. Uh, people see an orange butterfly and think, oh, it must be a monarch, but there are some monarch mimics one of them is the Viceroy. The monarch is a little bit larger than the Viceroy. The Viceroy has this black line skirting the bottom of its wing, something that the monarch does not have. So if you caught a butterfly 
with that little line skirting the bottoms of the wing, that's not a monarch, it's a viceroy. Let it go, let it enjoy the day. We need monarchs that have less veining and no little black line. So now we've established that. Um, this here is a very useful resource. It's called Butterflies of Southern and Eastern Ontario, um, put together by Rick Caverson. Uh, OntarioButterflies.ca is his website uh, where you can order these. Uh, it's a very good resource. I always have it with me. It shows you all the butterflies that we get down here. It's great to have in your pocket um, when you're out catching butterflies and enjoying the meadows as I often do. Um, another couple of resources. Um, Peterson's Field Guide to Eastern Butterflies. It tells you a lot about the butterflies, gives you some plates more technical. Um, these are the all of Eastern Ontario, Eastern, uh, sorry, Eastern Canada. This one butter is Butterflies on Ontario. This is from the Royal Ontario Museum. So it's the Rom Field Guide to Butterflies on Ontario. I love this book. It's got great pictures, talks about the whether they overwinter or migrate, shows you maps so you know if, you've, if you decide you've got a butterfly, if it really is a butterfly that's here or if you, you should be looking elsewhere talks about their host plants so if you're you know hoping to get a particular type of butterfly to your garden just look at what the host plants are what they're laying their eggs on and what the caterpillars are eating and this will tell you that it's very helpful and then of course there's the caterpillars you want to know what they like <laughs> which ones oh there's a lot of those because and then a lot of them of course are moths but it's very interesting to find out just what it is that you have in your garden I have quite a few giant swallowtail caterpillars around here right now um, because they overwinter. Um, uh, Eastern tiger swallowtail is another one. Um, some of them overwinter as pupa, some overwinter as, like the, the tawny emperor will overwinter as a, as a juvenile caterpillar wrapped up in a leaf. And then there are uh, morning cloaks, for example, that will overwinter as adults. So it's all very interesting to find out all of the, the different uh, ways that butterflies behave. But anyway, we're here to talk about monarchs and how we tag a monarch. And when people ask, may I always say the old pun very carefully, um, many people didn't know that you can actually tag a monarch. Um, the reason is so that we can understand the migration patterns and the, um, the situation of the butterfly. Uh, very much like banding birds, really, as you understand the population trends and the migratory patterns. So, except this is just for this one butterfly. This is the only butterfly that is being tagged. And um, tagging generally is being done as a citizen science project. So uh, people are all over North America are tagging butterflies. One thing I do have to mention is that the monarch is uh, a member of the um, species of risk in Ontario. And therefore, uh, working with the Long Point Basin Land Trust, uh, we have a permit that allows us to uh, collect and tag the monarch, uh, which uh, is true of all species of risk. Uh, you do need collection permits to, um, to do research and to handle them. So I just wanted to make that clear. Um, so very interesting for us. Last, um, I think it was in uh, 2017, we tagged a monarch. I, I, I tagged a monarch with with the whole workshop group at um, the George and Shirley Pond property in uh, in Turkey Point, and one of our monarchs was actually found in uh, Sierra de Chinqua in Mexico. So we were absolutely delighted to learn that one of the monarchs that we tagged here that year had made the journey all the way down to Mexico. It's very rewarding and uh, lets you know that. Uh, your little efforts are paying off. So um, these certificates are available uh, if you, from the database. Um, if your tag has been found, then you can print yourself out a certificate showing that you have uh, found one. And I have to admit, I do have a couple of them myself, which I'm pretty proud of. <laughs> uh, so, monarch tagging. First, we'll talk first about collecting and catching butterflies, butterflies in general. Now, many people like to go and catch butterflies with their children. And I just want to help you out so that you avoid more tears. 
because if you've got butterfly nets like this for your children, you're going to have tears because unfortunately they're too shallow. So basically when they catch those butterflies, they're going to come in and bounce right back out again. They look pretty and the kitties love them, but they're not going to catch a butterfly unless they're really, really slow butterflies. So if you want a small net, pick one that has a long net. Even better, which this is fine for the little children, but if you have bigger children, you need one with a wide opening and a long net because this will help you have the most success. So the technique, you're just going to watch me dancing here. I don't think there are any monarchs here right now. They're just being difficult. There's a lot of cabbage white, so I'll see if I can show you the technique with the cabbage white. I'll show it here before I move to the garden. Basically, there are two ways that I use. For example, if a butterfly is sitting right on top of the plant, right on top of the plant, for example here, on top of the linear, then we come up very slowly and we place the net on the top. Butterflies have a tendency to fly up, so they'll fly up into the top of the net. You can grab underneath where they have flown once they've got up there and then release underneath the butterfly. Another method, if it's sitting there, is to come very carefully. Patience is the key here. And just gently swipe across the top and then flip. That's the hard part, the flip. Because <laughs> that will trap your butterfly right in there. You can grab it and take it to where you need to put the tag on. Don't. <laughs> Believe me, I tried this a lot of times before I got it right, and I still, my first ones of the season are usually pretty hilarious as I'm tripping over my own feet and everything else trying to catch a butterfly. Um, so we go straight over the top, even on the ground, straight down. And this is fun for kids because if there's a, you know, a cabbage white or something down there, it's, it's very easy for them to just do that and then hold it down until it goes up into the top of the net versus the swiping, which is a little bit more difficult. So, um, shall we go give that a try? I have a big shadow on the ground. So the minute I put my shadow over that butterfly, it'll fly away because butterflies like sunshine. So when I'm trying to catch that butterfly, I have to be very careful not to put my shadow across that butterfly. And they're all flying around now, knowing that I want to catch them. They're very active. Just, just a hint, catching them in the air really is. Discerning taste, this cabbage white. And there we have our cabbage white. That was the sweep and flip method. There it goes. <laughs> so monarch tags are ordered from monarchwatch.org. That is where uh, at the University of Kansas, where the central database is housed for all of the monarch data for all the years that um, monarch tagging has been happening. Uh, when you receive your tags, you receive a newsletter, uh, which tells you all about how to tag, when to tag, uh, where the data goes and how to submit. You also receive the tags themselves, which 
are these tiny little dots that look like stickers on fruit which is actually interestingly how uh, the idea came to be um, and interesting again monarch tagging began in Canada another Canadian invention we should be proud of um, Professor Urquhart out of the University of Toronto uh, when he was a, a youngster wanted to know where all those butterflies were going um, that he saw along the north shore of Lake Ontario and he devised the earlier form of tagging um, which has grown to become the little tiny tags that we have now. Each of these tags, it's the white tags that we're using, not the orange ones, has um, a unique number uh, which is used, that we use to record on the data sheet. record the information on this sheet and then transfer it to a, a, an Excel spreadsheet and submit it electronically. Um, the information that's collected is the tag number, where it is that uh, we are tagging, the date, whether it is a male or female, and we'll talk a little bit about that, that um, you are tagging, uh, reared or wild, uh, and the location information. Also on the back, and instructions about how and where to tag the monarch. So, if you've forgotten everything I've told you when you receive your tagging sheet, it will tell you right here and spark your memory. Now, one of the th things that we do have to note on these sheets is whether the monarch is a male or a female. So, how do we sex a monarch? It's not like sexing chickens. So, do not fear. Uh, so I'm going to start with the monarch I have here. I collected a few earlier today, just so that we'd have them available. Yes, and we're tagging, only tagging fresh monarchs at this time of the year, because if they're worn and faded, they are still the parent monarchs that are hanging around. They won't be going to Mexico, so we want nice, Fresh monarchs, lovely orange color, beautiful orange color. You can see it's very fresh um, on the wing, barely got his wrinkles out. And this one, this is how you tell a male from a female. The male has scent glands on the hind wing. You can see right here these little black dots. Those are nose that tells us that they're male they're hard to see from below but easy to see from above and you'll notice how i'm holding the monarch i have it very gently held so that my finger here is on the body and the wing between very gentle and what i'm going to do there is a cell here that is shaped like a mitten so if you imagine this is a, a mitten here this is the thumb this is the hand and this is the area, because this is a big cell, it has the most area, flat area, on which to put the tag. So this is where we put it. We don't put it close to the body. We don't put it close to the back. We put it right here in the large central portion. So I'm going to grab a tag here. It is tag number A B P P zero seven zero, and I'm going to place it right on that mitten. And I'm going to take my thumb, keeping my finger on the back to protect, and just very gently press. My tag is right there. And once it's done, gently. goes. Okay, so we have claimed our monarch. I managed to get one here. And here we, I can tell that we have a boy. How, how can I tell that? Because of these scent glands right here. These little black dots, these little pouches. 
tell us that it's a male. You can't see them from the underside, but you can see them from the top side. And what we're band uh, tagging here are nice, fresh, bright monarchs. If they're faded or damaged, they're not going to Mexico. Um, the damaged ones will not have the wing capacity to get them there, and the faded ones are typically the parent um, uh, generation, so they're not going anyway. So nice, bright ones. This is a male. We're going to take our tag from our little sheet here, and our nail, and we're going to put it on this mitten here, the largest flat area, so it has more surface contact. Doesn't have to be up the right way. And then I press it very gently with my thumb, with my finger behind, so that I'm not damaging the monarch. And then he's ready to go. And off he goes. And there we go. Going to see what he can find. <laughs> Lovely. Would you like to see some more? Maybe we can find a female. Here we are, we've done our dance in the garden and found a very nice female monarch who we are going to carefully remove from the net. And we place our finger between the wings, along the body, and just keep thumb, finger, finger. So we're very carefully holding it and you'll feel it's little legs hanging on there. So what we have here is a female. We know this is a female because there are no black pouches or sacs on the hind wing. So this is this is exciting because this female will go down to Mexico, stay there till for about eight months and then she will mate with a male that's gone down there and then she will make a partial journey back to southern Texas and lay eggs. This is one magnificent woman. <laughs> Hear us roar. <laughs> so we are going to place a tag in the same place as we do on all of the monarchs. Our little tag. And this is tag number 073, leading letters A, B, P, P. We place the tag very carefully on that wide spot, right on the mitten there. Does not affect their ability to fly, as you will see momentarily. And she is anxious to go. And oh. yes, she likes us after all. There she goes. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Yeah, straight to the buddleia bush, the butterfly bush. That's it. She says, I'm hungry. I'm going to fill up. So, um, we have a, I have a couple more that I can uh, show you that I caught earlier today. And just, as I say, we have a permit to, to collect them momentarily. So, I collected these just an hour or so ago. And you'll notice that these are, seem to be different sizes. There isn't a, typically a different size between males and females. Some of the males are small, some of the females are huge, uh, some of the males are big. This is a nice, big, fresh male. So again, you can see those little black pouches. Beautiful, lovely, fresh wings, beautiful condition. Just a lovely, lovely butterfly. So again, we're going to put this mitten, the hand shape there, little thumb, and put our tag right there. I'm just going to write down my previous information so that I know that I have left my pen, so I won't know. <laughs> so here we go, the tag right there on the large part. Very carefully, very gently press between the finger here and here so as not to squish the veins or, or anything on the butterfly, but to make sure the tag is as secure as we can get it. I always tag on the same side of the butterfly 
I find that to be very helpful because once I let them go in the garden, if they hang around a while, I always know which side of the butterfly to check to make sure I haven't already caught that butterfly um, because I don't want to distress them by catching them two or three times because I'm, I can't remember where I put the tag. So I always put it on the same side of the butterfly. And then here we go, we're going to let them go. One, two, three. Happy as a lark. So now we've learned how to apply butterfly bling. What happens next? Well, the monarchs head down to Mexico in great numbers. In fact, um, just yesterday I had a report of up to 3,000 moving along the uh, the cliffs of uh, Lake Erie here, so they're definitely on the move. Um, they do like to migrate at temperatures between 60 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit, so we've had some cooler days, so they are definitely starting to move now. Um, so once they get to Mexico, as I mentioned, they hang in those uh, Oymal fir trees in the forest there for up to eight months um, before they start moving again. Uh, and uh, they mate, and the females move up to Texas to lay their eggs. Um, but what happens with the tags? How do we know? How do we get the information we need about the tags? Well, uh, after the monarchs have left, often there's a, well, there is a large contingent of, of um, butterfly wings on the forest floor. Well, many of those wings do not have tags, but some of those wings do have tags. So the local people in the area are invited into the monarch reserves to come and search for tagged monarch wings that have fallen to the forest floor. Um, they do this. This is a very a good way for these people to, to support themselves because the, um, the program when we buy our tags and we buy swag, uh, nets for example, I bought my nets from Monarch Watch and other things that I have here, uh, bug growing sleeves, etc. Um, the money that uh, goes towards those things and to the tags helps to support paying the local people uh, about five US dollars for each tag that they find. This helps to encourage the local people to um, protect the area. It is a source of income for them and it also creates a bit of a, a tourist um, a bit of economic tourism for the area. So um, there's a lot of illegal uh, logging and such that goes on uh, in that particular area. So this is it encourages people to protect it because they're getting their um, income from other sources that in include the monarch butterfly. So once the, uh, they have collected their tags from the forest floor, the University of Kansas, who keeps the database, they um, visit the uh, reserves couple of times during the spring season and the local people bring their tags to uh, the researchers and they're all recorded uh, based on the numbers and the, lo and the location of the reserve that they are at. Um, and then all of that data is fed back into the computers and we can get an understanding from that of the size of the migration success and um, and also males versus females, that's the information we have collected, and a lot of other information for researchers and for us, so that we know um, how successful we're being in our efforts to get the monarchs down to Mexico. Obviously, weather down there when they're, while they're um, overwintering plays a big impact in their success when they return, um, as well as factors like drought on their way down, drought on their way back, So that has an impact. So it's it's a tough life for a monarch, uh, but I think that we can help to make it a lot easier while they're with us here in Canada. So thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to answer some.